Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. It's been an awesome two weeks here. We've been looking at the issue of ocean plastics, what's happening, how it's affecting our environment, and then talking to some of the people who are fighting hard every day to try and solve the issue uh, and make our oceans a better place. So we have one more week of events to go, which I'm really looking forward to next week. But I'm really excited for today's Hangout. Today we have Sarah Mishler joining us. She's a film producer creating ads, films, and public service announcements. She's always had a deep love for the ocean. She grew up competitively sailing and swimming uh, on Long Island Sound. Uh, now her heart's pulling her to use film to inspire change. In July 2018, through the organization Expedition, she sailed with an all-female crew from Vancouver to Seattle exploring the remote coastlines for plastic pollution. And this trip was all about raising awareness for the use of single uh, use plastics and to celebrate women in science, leadership and adventure. Sarah even created a short film about the journey, uh, which was featured in US Gold Magazine in August 2018. So Sarah, it's so great to have you joining us live today. We're excited to learn a little bit more about uh, you and your journey. And uh, then I know our classrooms are gonna have lots of questions. Thank you, Joe. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to meet you all. Um, I'm super, super excited to be here talking to you. Um, and as Joe mentioned briefly, I work as a film producer. I just finished a movie that comes out next year. Um, I make a lot of commercials, a lot of sports commercials, PSAs, um, and it's really fun. But I have always had this intense love for the ocean, especially I'm obsessed with whales. I, from when I was a little girl, I've always loved whales, just been obsessed. And I, one day I was just thinking, I was like, you know what? I want to use film to um, teach about the ocean. And so I'm actually back in school now. I'm at New York University getting my master's in environmental education and conservation. And I'm going to try to make a series of films about the ocean so that we can I can put them in schools eventually. Um, so, and as uh, Joe mentioned, this summer I did this trip and, and it was incredible. It was one of the most difficult things I've done, but also one of the most inspiring and amazing things I've done. Um, and I wanna to talk to you about that. So I'm going to screen share this and we'll get started. Hold on, tie the screen. Okay, did that work? Can you see my screen? Yeah, and it looks like you're just gonna go full screen. Did it work? Potentially? Yeah, try hitting play again. It just didn't go full screen. Okay, it's thinking. All right, we can let it think. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's see. Maybe let me quit it and open it again. Sure. It's just just like technology. Sometimes <laughs> always hard, other times not so much. Always when you want it to work, it doesn't. Okay. Yeah. Well worst comes to worst, if it doesn't go full screen, it was pretty close to full screen in the in the slide view. So we can always go that way. <laughs> All right, well, maybe we just try it this way. Doesn't like it this morning. All right, let me just quit it one more time. Oh, now it did it. <laughs> Hold on, sorry. That's okay, it happens. And that's the beauty too, is we can always edit this part out in the, in the recorded version. Make it look flawless. Okay, well, as you can see on this image, that's an image of the ocean that we're all used to seeing. Um, it's beautiful. It seems like it goes on forever. Um, and it's, it's vast, it's deep, and you think that nothing can ever get in the way of it. Here's a, another fo a photo. That was our boat that we were sailing on in the Pacific. So we started off in Vancouver and we went out um, into the Pacific and eventually ended up in Seattle. But again, here's just a photo of the ocean. It looks like it can go on forever. Nothing can affect it. Um, you may have heard that there are problems with the ocean, but it doesn't look sick at all. It looks beautiful and blue and deep. Um, 
We even saw orcas. This was, I started crying. I was so excited. We saw a whole family of orcas. That's a little baby orca that um, was jumping out of the water. And when you see this, you think, hey, the ocean is doing pretty well. It doesn't seem like there's anything wrong with it. Look, it's a beautiful, beautiful um, blue home for these whales. Um, and so we were doing science every day. And that is this device called a mantatrol. And basically we throw it into the ocean. As you can see, that was some of the, um, two of the girls, that's um, one of the scientists and behind, behind her is Emily who founded this whole trip. She's throwing the mantatrol into the ocean. And what it does is you put it in for 30 minutes and you just let it sit on the top of the surface of the ocean and it collects and its little tail in the back, um, it collects anything that might be on the top of the surface of the ocean. And so when we first dumped this into the ocean, I thought, we're not going to find anything. I know I've read and I've learned about how pl plastics is a huge problem, but look how big the ocean is. There's no way that we're going to find anything. And after 30 minutes, we pull it out, and that's what we saw. And just tiny, tiny, tiny particles of plastic broken down. I couldn't believe it. After 30 minutes of something that looked perfectly blue and pristine, that there would be so much plastic. Um, it was shocking. This you can see, those are chunks of plastic. And if you look on the top of it, you can see that an animal has, on both of them, it looks like an animal has started to take a bite out of both of, of these chunks of plastic, which is really hard to see. And you know, when you see orcas like that, this is their home and you don't want, you don't want to be polluting it with disgusting plastic that, that they think is a food source. And, and um, we don't want to eat plastic. They don't want to eat plastic. It's just a huge problem. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you a little short version of the film I made. Hopefully this can work. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. You may wonder what 11 amazing women are doing out here on a boat in the middle of the Pacific. X Expedition is a series of all women sailing voyages. Over the last four years, we've crisscrossed our way around the globe looking at the marine plastic pollution issue in our seas. While we're out on these missions, we're doing scientific research. We're trying to better understand the impact that plastic pollution is having on our oceans, chemicals that are getting into the food chain that can harm us as well. The more I learned about the impact it has on our body, the more I realised that particularly for us girls, it has huge significance. The fact that we can pass these chemicals on to the next generation, our children, and the way they affect our hormones. So why not tackle this women-focused issue with a team of amazing ladies? Something we can all do is think about our own plastic consumption particularly single-use plastic, a plastic that's in our lives for 10 minutes or half a day, and then it's gone. If we can minimize that, the plastic bottles, the drinking straws, the coffee cups, as much as possible, we're going to go a long way to actually solve the problem. Um, so that's just a really brief look. Hold on, let me go back to my slides. That's just a very brief look at um, at the trip um, and what we saw. Um, so as so as I mentioned, it was all women on this boat. There weren't any boys, which is was a pretty special thing. And that you can see pulling the line. That's the captain of the boat. Um, she was incredible. Um, super, super talented sailor. And when we when we were out there, uh, we hit some bad weather. You you can't really predict. You know, you schedule this these dates to go, and you never you don't you can't really do it around weather. So we hit some bad weather some days, and um, we had to sail through the night. So that was some of us. That's what we the our foul our foul weather gear. Um, and if you can see around our necks, 
we had to wear these harnesses and strap ourselves in because if you hit a big wave, you don't want to fall off the boat. But the captain and the crew were amazing. And um, some girls had never been sailing before. I grew up sailing, um, which was definitely nice to have some experience. But some girls had never sailed before. And the crew taught us how to sail. We sailed through the night. We sailed in shifts of three hours. You were sailing. Three hours, you weren't sailing. And it was the most positive, exciting, um, inspiring group of women. And we just, you would um, laugh with each other throughout the night. Some, sometimes you, the waves were so big, you couldn't really see over the whole of the boat, but it was really fun. It was an adventure that we were going on to study plastics. Um, we sailed up to this northern, um, northern part of Canada called the Broken Islands, and no one lives on these islands. They're incredibly beautiful, and we wanted to go explore and see if there's any plastic up there, um, because a lot of times, I used to think that, oh, plastic just comes if people are really bad and they don't throw out their trash. But we went to these uh, islands, this, this, these little broken islands that they call them, where no one lives. And we found so much plastic that had washed up. And what was really interesting is we saw some bottles, like you can see Dasani, that is a bottle, a type of water bottle we recognize. But there are water bottles from um, with with writing, I, I didn't know how to read from different Asian countries, from all over the world. We were find, finding trash that had washed across the Pacific and ended up on these beautiful untouched islands. And it was just so shocking to see. Um, then we would go when we had, when we weren't sailing, when it wasn't our shift to sail, we were doing science on the boat. And we were looking through a microscope to see what kinds of plastic we were finding. We found a lot of fibers from clothing um, which was really shocking. That was also something I didn't know about, that uh, certain washing machines, um, that next to me is one of our scientists, and she is studying about washing machines um, and with uh, that, that certain clothing types that you can have fibers when you put it in the washing machine, wash off, go into the washing machine, and eventually through the water source, end up in the ocean. Um, and so that's some of the plastic that we saw when we were looking in the microscope. And you might think, okay, so this is so tiny. This is so, so tiny. Um, and that the ocean is so big. Why do these tiny particles even matter? These little chunks of plastic, are they really that bad? But yes, because if you think about it, who's, who's in the ocean? The fish, and that's a whale shark, but... Any, any source that, that is in the, any living being in the ocean, they're eating those tiny bits of plastic. Um, and it looks a lot like food. Um, I would be cons I'm sure we would be confused if a restaurant served us something like that. We would be confused too. And so it's and also if you eat fish, if you eat fish, then that plastic could be going into your body. So it's a really shocking and um, difficult problem that we have to think about. So this is the whole group um, of the that was that we sailed with. And they were some of the most inspiring women from all over the world. Um, I was the only American, which was uh, pretty cool. And one thing that Emily, Emily is in the middle um, and she started all of the trips. And, and one thing that she kept asking us when we were on the boat, was what's your superpower? What can you do? Everyone has a superpower. What can you do? And um, the girl who's next to me, she is a scientist. And I have to admit, I am not a scientist. I'm not very good at science. <laughs> but um, I was thinking, what can I do? And I'm a filmmaker. And I like to tell stories with images. And that's my superpower. And I also, on a very basic level, I like to talk. And that is also my superpower. If I can just talk and talk about the problem and tell as many people that I know that, hey, don't use plastic bags, avoid single use plastics, that's a superpower. Um, so I wanna ask all of you and turn it back to you. You each have a superpower and what's your superpower? How can you help us fight this problem? Because it's going to come from everyone. It's not gonna come from uh, a few politicians or a few scientists. It's gonna come from everyone wanting to change and fight this problem. So think about it. What is your superpower? What can you do in your community to try to um, 
stop this plastic problem in our ocean. Okay, so thank you. Now I'd love to, Joe, should we go to questions? Absolutely. Okay, hold on me. Can you see me again? Oh yeah, there. Now You're you back. See. All right, well, Sarah, first, thank you so much for sharing some of that journey with us. It looked incredible. Um, and I think it's really important that students see that even in the most remote places where humans are far away from, our waste, our trash, our plastic is still washing up all over these beaches and spreading all throughout our oceans. Yeah. And it was great to see a picture of you with Imogen Napper. We just hosted her yesterday for an event. Oh, amazing. Imogen is incredible. She is, I mean, as I said, I can't do science, but she is incredible. And if you like science, you can change the world with science. It's amazing. Yeah. So teachers, if you do want to dig a little bit deeper, uh, either later this week uh, or next week, we do have a hangout with Imogen and she talks about her research and it's pretty interesting stuff that she's doing. But Sarah, I think it's time to meet some classrooms and let's take some of the questions because I'm sure there's some about maybe filmmaking, plastics in our oceans, and of course your awesome journey. Yeah. So our first class that we'll go to, we'll visit Mrs. Reed's group, grade five students in Algonquin, Illinois. Give me a moment, we'll turn their microphone on. How are we doing, grade fives? Say hi. 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 All right, go ahead. Um, how, do you, how long do you think it took for you to sail to Seattle? So it took us um, eight days, seven nights and eight days. And um, I have to tell you, so when we first got there, I had never met any of these women before. And I was really nervous. I was really nervous because I'd never met any of any of them. We we had talked over Skype, like how we are right now. And I got onto the boat, and um, how the sleeping arrangement was done was that you're on all these little bunks, and so and each night you had to kind of strap yourself into the bunk because if you hit waves, you don't want to fall out of the bunk. Um, and, but I was really nervous because I had never met anyone before and all of a sudden you have to, you're all sleeping and, and going on this adventure together. Um, and yeah, so it took us eight days and at and my first night I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to take, this is going to be such a long week, but it went by like that. It was so, it, it, I couldn't believe it was over when it finally finished. Um, but yeah, it, it took us eight days, seven nights, eight days. All right, thanks for that question. Great question to start us off. We're gonna to go to Mrs. Cope's group, grade sixes, joining us in Cinnamonson, uh, New Jersey. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, New Jersey? Hey! Say hey. hey. hi! Hi! Hi. Uh, how much is the most amount of plastic you sell in one spot? So um, the most amount of plastic we saw in one spot, probably on the island, because when we were out on the ocean, um, I wasn't on the group that sailed. There was another group that sailed from Hawaii to Vancouver, which took three weeks. And they went through one of these gyres, which is one of these kind of plastic islands where they bring all this, where the currents kind of gather these this plastic together. And I didn't see that. Um, I was on the shorter trip that was the second part of this this summer's expedition and so probably on the island was the most plastic that I saw because it was all in one area that had washed up onto the beach and when we were out um, in the Pacific in the middle of the ocean we were just taking sample data from the manta troll so it was just those tiny pieces of plastic that had broken down um, and which was still a lot for just sticking in the device for 30 minutes, but probably on the shore, all of that plastic that had washed up from, from all over the world was the most that I saw at one time. Yeah, it was pretty shocking. All right, let's meet another classroom. Let us go this time. We're going to go to Pulaski, Wisconsin. We've got some grade sevens joining us with Mr. Landers. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, grade sevens? Hi. Excellent. Hi. 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 
How long do you think it would take down, how long do you think it would take the sun or whatever it takes to break down a plastic water bottle? That's a really good question. And I actually, I don't know the answer to that question. That's a great question. I would have to ask the scientists on the boat, Imogen. Um, you know, I think it depends. I don't know. I don't want to answer you incorrectly. So that's a great question. And I'm going to ask Imogen and get back to you. Um, they were the experts on the boat. So just so you know, we had two scientists on the boat. And then the rest of us were from all different industries. So I was a filmmaker. We had an actress on the boat. We had um, a BBC commentator. We had a photographer. We had all different sorts of people. Um, but the two scientists were so key because I, as I mentioned, I'm not a scientist and they would just answer all of our great questions. So that's a fantastic question. And I'm going to ask her because I don't want to give you a wrong answer. I could guess, but I want to ask her and make sure. So thank you. That was a all great right. question. All right. And just to add to that, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's called photo degradation. And sometimes you're fooled into thinking the plastic's gone or broken up but it's just breaking up into smaller and smaller pieces uh, and then making it easier and easier to enter the food web and then move uh, through the food chain. So um, even though it might look like it's getting smaller, it's still the same amount of plastic and takes hundreds, if not thousands of years before that plastic disappears. So I'm really glad that you brought up photo degradation. You guys must be studying plastics. Uh, let's see, Mrs. Jenko with grade fives are joining us in Toronto, Ontario. So here in Canada with me, let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing Toronto? Good. What, um, the question you, she made of, of um, getting the word out there. Sorry, will you say it one more time? It cut out just in the okay. beginning. Um, what was the first movie you made to get the word out there? About plastics? Yes. The one I just showed you. So that um, that was my the first film I made about this because, so we went, when was it? It was in the end of July and I got back at the beginning of August. And so that little film I showed you was the first film I made um, about the plastics issue. But right now I'm working on a film um, in this, it's it's in virtual reality. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of virtual reality, but it's pretty cool. You have to put on these goggles and um, you kind of, you look all around and it looks like you're actually in the place where, where you're looking. It's so cool. Yeah, you guys, I'm sure know what it, what it is, but I'm working on a film right now that follows the journey of a plastic bag. And so when I'm done with that, I'd love to share it with everyone. Um, but the film I showed you, that short little two minute piece was the first film I made about plastics um, after the trip. Thank you for your question. All right, let's head to Virginia Beach this time. Um, oh, there they are. We've got some high school stu students joining us from Virginia Beach uh, in the US at First Colonial. Let me turn their microphone on. All right, how's it going boys and girls? Good, how are you guys? Great. So, Great. <laughs> so since we live so close to the Atlantic Ocean and the Chesapeake Bay, we were wondering what are some local efforts we could do to um, start reducing the amount of plastic we use. That's a great question. And um, a lot of people ask me this, and it, it depends on each person, but the biggest thing that I think, and it's very simple to do, is to just stop using single-use plastics. Um, you know, it's it's so much more convenient, I guess, to just use a plastic bag once and throw it out or use a plastic water bottle and throw it out. But it's really not that hard to use a reusable water bottle, to use a canvas bag. Um, and if people were to limit and just avoid single-use plastics, it would make such a big difference. Um, so if you can spread the word and tell your parents, tell your friends, your family to just not use single-use plastics, it would be make a huge, huge, huge impact um, on stopping the plastic from getting into the ocean. That's a great question. But I think that's the most simple way to kind of personally try to combat the problem. Yeah. All right. Awesome. And that is such a good point um, about being leaders. So you know, it may seem different at first if you're picking up the trash you see when you're randomly walking around 
or if you're carrying around, I'm trying to train myself to make sure I have my bottle all the time. And the other thing I've been trying to carry more is these utensils in my bag. Because then yeah. uh, the throwaway one. So trying to train myself to keep this kind of thing. And then other people are going to see you, your friends, your family, and that's going to really inspire them. You're that leader who kind of gets people changing their minds and thinking about other things they could do. So great question. We have not been to Mrs. Saga yet. Uh, Mrs. Holloway's got some great sevens joining her. And I'll just need you to turn your microphone on for me because you're just off of my screen. We have so many classrooms today. And then we want to hear a big hi. And then we'd love to, to steal a question. Hi. Hey, David, and Reagan, how many would you love to go on next next like this? I would. I would. Hey, that's awesome. Hi, so um, we're from David Leader, and this is what we're working on right now. It's about whales, and um, yeah, and we were learning about whales and plastic bags and how they affect the ocean and women in science. So my question to you is that when you were on sale, did you find any fish or any animals that had any damaged things on them or like plastic inside of them? That's a great question. Um, and no, we did not see anything that um, while we were sailing, we saw that family of orcas, which was one of the best moments of my life because as I mentioned, I am obsessed with whales. Um, and, but we didn't see um, anything personally, but that's not to say that uh, that, that of course it's out there in the ocean, which really makes me so sad. You know, I don't know if anyone has heard of this um, TV series called Blue Planet, but it's it's incredible, incredibly well done. And if and but these filmmakers, one thing that people don't realize is that they sit out in the ocean, um, under the ocean for hours and days. I think they had like four hundred hours of footage after they finished filming that and they had to narrow it down to make, um, you know, a 60 minute show. And so uh, we just weren't out there for long enough to be able to uh, get footage like that. Um, also, yeah, and so that's a great question, but we didn't see anything personally that uh, with the fish, but it's definitely affecting them. Um, and you can see it from other filmmakers who have who have who have gotten that fo footage, especially in Blue Planet, and they dedicate some of their episodes. Uh, David Attenborough talks about the plastic problem. Um, so if you have some time, check out that show. It's really, really well done and super informative on um, the ocean and and what's happening. A great question, and I love that you're learning about whales. It's so cool. All right, so I want to give a shout out to uh, Mrs. Brinker, who's joining us uh, from New York, and she is in the library, and they're testing out their technology today. So I'm going to turn her microphone on, let her say hi, and see if she has a question for uh, Sarah. Hi there. Sure, I'll ask Sarah a question. Um, I was wondering if she knows how many gyres are in the oceans in a hole that have plastic islands. There are five, five gyres around the world, but the um, North Pacific gyre. I've been told by Emily is the densest um, plastic accumulation in the world, but there are five total. Um, yeah, it's pretty shocking. And uh, we saw some of the samples. They still had some samples on the boat because um, the crew before us got off in Vancouver like a few days before we got on. And we're in this big um, email and group chat, all of us. We hope to meet, I'll meet one day, but they, they, um, yeah, they said it was so shocking that for seven days straight, they were just sailing through plastic. Um, and for us, a lot of the plastic that we saw was broken down into little particles, but for them, they were seeing big chunks as well on the surface and just seven days straight were sailing through plastic, which is really, really shocking. Yeah, but there's a total of five. That's a great question. All right, so we've swung through, we visited all our classrooms. I'm going to start turning on mics again, and we'll visit classrooms for some follow-up questions. So let's mix it up a little this time. Let's start in Mr. Lander's class, see if you guys have another question. We have one coming up. We also, we're uh, within the Great Lakes watershed, so even though the ocean 
uh, we have our inland sea that we consider the Great Lakes to be. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at. So we have a student here, Marna, who's going to ask a question. Yeah. I was wondering how all the plastic in the like um, gar garbage patch got there. That's a great question. Um, so um, it got there from a number of ways, from what I understand. And the big thing with these gyres is that the currents bring bring the plastic together into the into the into these accumulations. Um, and I think it comes from all different sources. I think it comes from land where um, it's very easy for for plastic. I live in New York City, and I learned that it's extremely easy for a plastic bag to end up in the gutters and just through that route end up in the ocean. So I see plastic bags all the time on the street. And even if I pick them up, I know that there's hundreds and thousands of plastic bags that can end up in the ocean. So I think a lot of it comes from land sources um, that can end up in the ocean. I think, of course, um, from, I mean, it's any trash all over the world. It's just the currents that bring it together into this accumulation. Um, and that can, that just cause this giant, giant gyres to form. But um, it comes from, from if even if you're not on, on the beach or on the shore, it can come from inner cities like me in New York City. It's really shocking. And it's something I hadn't realized before. Um, Joe, do you want to add anything to that about? Morrison? Yeah, and you know, especially after big hurricanes and big storms and big events. So I know in Virginia Beach, you may have caught a little bit of Florence, and especially in the Carolinas, that big storm brings all that water up, and that's going to pull a ton of garbage and plastics from land out into the ocean, riverways or conduits that bring it into the ocean, and unfortunately, people are just messy and don't care sometimes, and It'll be thrown off of boats and thrown onto beaches and blown into the water, just like you said, Sarah. So there's so many ways it gets into the ocean. And then those currents can carry it all over the world. So we had a hangout uh, with someone named Kahi, and he runs an organization called Sustainable Coastlines in Hawaii. And even though there's these beautiful islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, um, and most of the garbage doesn't come from Hawaii, but they can, they never run out of beach cleanup days because it's always washing on shore from as far away as Asia, from the west coast of Canada and the United States. And Hawaii just sits right in those currents. So the the, the plastics build up there. So it, it's a big problem. It gets into the ocean so many different ways. Um, and like you said, Sarah, we've got to stop those uh, single use plastics. And that's what's going to make a big difference. Yeah. Um, Oh, sorry, were you going to say something, Sarah? No, I was just going to say that's a good point about storms. Um, and a lot, of, a, a lot of the plastic that we saw on the Broken Islands, they think washed over from storms that happened, um, which was really shocking to think about. All right, Mrs. Saga, Mrs. Holloway's class, if you want to turn your microphone back on. Oh, I think you turned it on, but then right off really quickly. We heard you for a second and lost you again. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Hi, my name is Ashwarya, and I wanted to know if you know or seen any animal, any endangered animals that have been affected by plastic in the oceans. I have not, personally, I have not seen any. Um, and on the trip, the highlight was the orcas, um, but... No, I didn't see, we didn't see that many on the trip. We saw a ton of birds, but no, we didn't see any endangered um, animals. But I, again, I think you should try to check out the show Blue Planet because they talk a lot about that and they show you, um, they had, they, it's such an advanced production that did the show and they have tiny, tiny, tiny little cameras that they can put into the ocean. They even put this little camera into a seashell um, and they just left it there for a while. And this fish um, that they ha it has this big two buck teeth and they use their teeth to try to break shells. 
um, they put it in the seashell that I was using to break its its shell onto. And so it got super up close. They used these tiny, tiny cameras um, and the fish never knew that, that anyone was filming it. And so um, that it's a really cool show. And you can see in the deep, deep ocean and they talk about what's affecting plastic. Um, they even show some fish that um, like in Finding Nemo, that I think they're called clownfish, that what Nemo is, um, a whole family was actually swimming next to a plastic bottle, which was really shocking um, when they were making their home. And so, but they, because Blue Planet, the production, the crew had these tiny cameras that they could just leave there and not disturb um, while they were filming, they were able to get incredible footage. So we really only saw what was on the surface and we're so lucky to see this family of whales. The whales actually started playing with our boat. It was so cute. They swam right up to us and there was a little baby, there were a few, two babies and a mom and, um, and they swam right up to our boat. It was so cool. And the baby was showing off and was doing big jumps and flips. It was incredible. And it just made you realize how intelligent this um, the whales, these orcas are, and that they want to interact. Um, they, were say, they were completely saying hello. And they stayed with us for about 45 minutes just playing, which was so cool. It was so cool. Um, but yeah, check out the show because I didn't have equipment like that to be able to get these tiny, um, very intimate moments of underwater life. But this crew was incredible that got it. But thank you, that's a great question. All right, Mrs. Reed, your microphone's coming back on if you guys have another question. Um, Sid, your captain, um, was he, was, is he the only one that uh, drove the boat or did she sleep? That's a great question. And no, we all drove the boat, which was um, pretty cool. So she, of course, when we were docking or when the weather got really bad, um, she would drive the boat. But part of the adventure was that we all got to drive the boat. And so how it worked was that you were broken down into you, you had a buddy. So it was a buddy system. And you would sail, you would be on your watch for three hours, and then you would be, you could sleep for three hours, and then you would be on your watch for three hours, and then you could sleep for three hours. And when you were on your watch, you were always with, um, there were three professional crew, the captain and then two professional crew. And so one of, one of the women, the professional, would always be with you on your watch, but they might have to be looking at the navigation system to make sure that we're not going to bump into a giant ship and so I would have to steer the boat or my buddy would have to steer the boat. Um, and what's funny is a lot of girls, it's, it's, it was, it, we hit some bad weather and there are huge waves. And so a lot of people, I got lucky somehow and I didn't get seasick, but a lot of the girls got really seasick. But a good sailor's trick when you get seasick is if you drive the boat, it makes you feel better because you're looking out, you kind of, your brain balances when you're looking at the horizon. And so anytime someone felt seasick, they uh, would drive the boat and it would help them a lot. But we all got to do it, which was really cool. And it's, um, yeah, it's a very special thing when you're, this giant ship is in your hands and you have to steer it through those big waves. It's really cool. All right, that sounds like a lot of fun. Mrs. Jenko, your microphone's coming back on. Um, our question is, which animal is the most effect affected by the plastic? That's a great question. And I don't know what animal is most affected by it, but I really think that I mean, when you think about it, everything is connected under the water. So if a little fish, if a fish eats a, it eats a piece of plastic and then a bigger fish eats a piece of plastic, um, it's all part of the food source. And if we eat, if we um, eat fish that has a piece of plastic, we're then eating that plastic. So um, maybe Joe knows better than I do about what's most effective, but I really think it's all one big thing that it's part, if it gets into the food source, it's affecting everything, um, big or little. Do you wanna add anything to that, Joe? Yeah, I think I'd add to that, that unfortunately we don't really know for sure because think of how big the oceans are. We only see a small percentage of seabirds or turtles or whales that wash up on shore. So think of how much more are maybe dying out in the middle of the ocean and sink uh, and never make it to shore. So 
unfortunately, we only understand a small part of the problem. We don't understand um, the full picture because it's impossible to see the full picture with the oceans being so big. But one animal that we've talked about last week, we had a scientist uh, named Jennifer from Tasmania. And she specifically goes out to these remote islands to look at the seabirds like the albatross and the petrels to see how they're doing. And their population numbers are falling like crazy because the parents go out, they're looking for food, plastic, little pieces of plastic look like little fish, little creatures on the top of the ocean. They come back and they feed all that plastic to their young. So their young feel full. Um, they're not getting any nutrients and they're dying. So seabirds are in a lot of trouble, especially on remote islands, the albatross and birds like that. So we don't really have a complete picture yet. Um, and it's gonna be really hard to get that picture with the oceans being so big. Uh, Mrs. Cope's class, I don't think we've been to your class for round two. Your microphone's on. I just wanted to know what kinds of clothes have plastic fibers? That's a great question. Um, and Imogen, Imogen, who we mentioned earlier, the scientist who's doing this research, um, she's in the process of doing all of this. But if you, from what she explained to me, um, a really um, basic way to think about it is if you if you think of, of, have you seen those sweaters that sometimes they get the little balls if you rub them? Those are really bad, unfortunately. I know they're really cozy and warm, but a lot of that um, can break off and, end up in um, the ocean, like fleeces. We were, we, uh, Emily asked us not to bring, I know, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's really comfortable and cozy, but Emily asked us not to bring any fleeces on the boat because um, any of anything that we're right on the ocean when we are sailing and, and we don't wanna get, we don't wanna add fibers to the ocean. And also when we were doing science, um, we we were putting like buckets on the deck that could collect air samples and everything. And if we had that type of clothing that can that can come off, um, it could it could contaminate the samples. So Imogen is in the process of doing this research right now, and she's um, looking into which washing machines are bad and which are better. And um, and so when she she's going to send us an update on her research and. That would be a great follow-up um, to find out from her. And, and maybe I could send via Joe um, when she has an update to her, to her um, research. But that's a great question. All right. Yeah. Really good question. And I remember yesterday that uh, Imogen mentioned polyester. That polyester. Yeah, polyester. Yeah. A bad material for those, um, those fibers getting washing out uh, storm drains, rivers, and then into our lakes and our oceans. So. Yeah. Um, Virginia Beach, let's go there one more time. One more question from our high schoolers. Your microphone is on. Hi. Um, locally, a lot of restaurants have a thing where they don't use plastic straws anymore. My question for Emma is, does she believe that a nationwide ban on single-use plastic should be in effect? Yes, I do. And um, slowly, slowly, cities and states are starting to do this. I think Seattle is actually the first city to pass um, pass a ban on straws. Um, and it's a great question. And I really do because there's great alternatives to it. And I know it sounds really shocking, like no more straws, ban straws, but just use a bamboo straw, use a paper straw. There's so many different ways that you can still um, fill your need of straws or of cutlery, just use bamboo cutlery um, and use a reusable water bottle. Um, I really do. And I'm actually working right now on writing a bill to pass, a, to ban um, plastic bags in New York City. Um, so we'll see what happens. But I completely think there should be a nationwide ban. And um, one thing that we talked a lot about on the boat was uh, what I think would be incredible would be if we were to standardize recycling so that each city could, it, we just need to make it easier. If we could really understand um, across the country how to recycle. Um, it's, it's complicated right now. It's different colors in different cities, different states. If you were to just standardize recycling and make it super simple for people, then no one would have any, ex any excuse not to recycle. 
Um, also, it would be amazing if they were to standardize plastic. Right now, there's a ton of different types of plastic. And if they were to make one type of plastic, if they have to use plastic, um, that, that type could be recycled because some types can be recycled, some types can't be recycled. And you know, plastic, there is some good. A lot of our, our medical equipment is made out of plastic. Our entire boat was made out of plastic. Um, plastic is, a, is, does have some, some good, but there's a lot of bad types of plastic and we don't need to use uh, single use plastics, save it for the good things. So that's a great question. And yes, I really do think that it should be banned <laughs> across the country and I'll, I'll keep you posted on what happens in New York City. All right. Well, first of all, classrooms, thank you so much for joining us today. As always, your questions were amazing. Uh, and I'm excited to hear that many classrooms are working on different plastic inquiries, so that's awesome. And then Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, we can tell you were really inspired, so thank you for what you're doing since uh, your journey, and I'm looking forward to seeing your future films. I think it sounds like you've got some exciting projects coming down the pipeline. Yeah, thank you so much, Joe. This was so much fun. So nice to meet all of you. All right. Well, the last thing we'll do is we'll turn all the microphones on. We'll let the classrooms get loud, say goodbye and thank you, and then we'll sign off for today. So here we go. Microphones coming on. Classrooms, nice and loud. Bye and thank you. Thank you. Thanks for hanging out. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.